Pichler from Innsbruck. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Hannes, and uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, our work that uh, I've been doing in Innsbruck together with uh, Peter Zoller, which is my, was my PhD supervisor, and in collaboration with Thomas Amos and Benoit Tarnasch. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about will be very much motivated by work that we have sort of seen already in earlier talks today where atoms uh, or atom-like systems are coupled to uh, 1D uh, photonic uh, waveguides and nanostructures. And for example, we heard the jock talk by uh, Jeff Thompson, uh, but also uh, in, in the Kimball group, and uh, where these experiments are now pushing, sort of we heard that they're pushing in the direction where these atoms, when they emit, they preferentially sort of emit into this uh, 1D photonic structure rather than to the outside world, and that's sort of the, the regime where we are most interested uh, in looking at this sort of from a theoretical point of view. Uh, yeah, one of the sort of remarkable features of these nanophotonic structures, and we already heard uh, talks by uh, Philipp Schneeweiss from the Russian Party Group and also Peter Lodal, uh, that these structures uh, now have sort of in a natural way. Uh, in these structures, systems couple differently to, to left than to right moving excitations. And uh, I mean, Arnold Rauschenbottles group has shown this for, for nanoparticles, but also sort of for two level emitters. And uh, the same thing we've heard about it sort of in, uh, in for, for atomic like systems, sort of quantum dots in, in photonic crystal waveguides. And what uh, we are interested, sort of from a theoretical point of view, is what happens if you have now not just one of these emitters, but, but many of these emitters coupled to such a waveguide? What's the non-equilibrium dynamics of these emitters interacting via this waveguide? And this will sort of be uh, the first part of my talk. Uh, but before I come to that, let me point out that we are also sort of interested in, in different physical uh, systems where one uh, finds uh, uh, chiral coupling. For example, we have sort of uh, shown that one can, for example, couple uh, atoms to an atomic reservoir where, where photons are sort of replaced by, by Bogolyubo for elementary excitations in this BEC. And uh, spinor, uh, you know, chiral coupling to, to these, these excitations in, in such a system does not come naturally in the sense we sort of have to engineer uh, these, these different coupling to left and right moving excitations and in this setup uh, the, the key ingredient was uh, sort of including a synthetic spin orbit coupling in, in, the, in the reservoir gas. And there are other incarnations of, of, of such uh, chiral system reservoir coupling, and one thing we are looking at uh, at the moment is sort of where one couples spins now, not to sort of photonic or phononic waveguide, but sort of uh, chains, uh, spin chains. And that are you know described by by uh, x y Hamiltonian in the bath, and so where where the, the the system can sort of give its excitation to this spin chain and this propagates via flip flop interactions and in 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 these incarnations here uh, a chiral system reservoir interaction appears uh, if you sort of make this coupling uh, you know slightly non local and you introduce here an artificial gauge field in this little triangle, and then you can also show that in principle you can couple only to sort of one side of this excitation spectrum and therefore you know, realize a, a chiral system bus interaction. But uh, I'm not going to talk about these things in this talk. What I would like to talk about is uh, sort of new theoretical uh, questions that these kind of systems open. And uh, in particular, we're interested in, in different variants of sort of non-Markovian physics that one can observe in, in, in these uh, setups. And uh, we've heard already about sort of non-Markovian physics that uh, arises from uh, non, not making the, the rotating wave approximation in Jose uh, Cassieri Paul's talk. And uh, what we are interested in is sort of uh, non-Markovian physics that comes sort of from a feedback. And the most simple uh, system that we can sort of draw that, that shows such, such a physics is, is an atom coupled to a 1D fiber. 
and uh, where this uh, fiber here is terminated by a mirror. And this mirror now is, is very far away, and very far away in the sense that the delay time of a photon propagating towards this mirror is, is comparable or longer than, than the em lifetime or the emission rate, the time given by the emission rate of the atom into the waveguide. So uh, in, in such a situation, the atom will be sort of entangled with this whole output field that uh, it produces, and then this output field, after some uh, delay time, will hit the atom again, and in that sense, that's what we call a, a quantum feedback. And there are also sort of different versions of, of such problems. You know, one is, uh, one cannot thi think also about not having an atom in the mirror, but sort of two atoms that are, are coupled via the waveguide, and, and usually sort of what I will also talk about in my, in the first part of my talk is a situation when these atoms are sort of closed in this uh, delay time limit, and this is, of course, the description of the standard Mar uh, Markovian mass equation. But then we're interested in what happens uh, if you, if you uh, separate these things here uh, far in, in, this, in this limit. And we've heard also talks about uh, this, this uh, problem uh, yesterday uh, that sort of attacked uh, this problem with, with this S-matrix uh, formalism. Uh, what we want to do is something that is sort of a complementary to this or a different route. Uh, yeah, we want to have the situation where you have you know, not, not just one or two, but possibly also more photons in this thing. And what we want to do is we want to use sort of matrix product states or DMRG techniques to, to study such problems. These are techniques that are developed in, in condensed matter uh, theory and quantum information to describe uh, one-dimensional uh, many-body systems. And uh, they're also sort of extended to describe time dependence in these systems, and that's exactly what we have here. We have a 1D system, uh, and we want to study the sort of the time-dependent dynamics. And what, we, what I want to do in, in this talk is apply these methods to, to this type of quantum optical problems, and in particular, we want to sort of uh, write down a matrix product state version for the quantum stochastic Schrodinger equation. So the outline of my talk uh, is very roughly like this. In the first tar part, I would like to talk about physics of sort of spins coupled in a chiral way to a 1D waveguide, where we will just look at the Markovian uh, dynamics of this thing, where they are sort of close in this delay time limit. And we will show that there is an interesting sort of steady state of these atoms if the symmetry between left and right moving coupling to left and right moving excitations is broken. And in the second part of that, my talk, I will sort of move on from there and also use this in a certain sense as an example to illustrate how we, how we treat these kind of feedback problems. What happens now if you, if you take these atoms apart? Okay. So uh, let me dive into the first part. So I should mention this is to uh, work done in Innsbruck with, with Thomas Amos, Kai Steinigl, and also sort of Peter Abel was involved in this uh, works uh, and in collaboration also with, with Andrew Daly from the uh, University of uh, Strathclyde in Glasgow. So as I said, we're now interested sort of in a network of, of two-level systems or atoms uh, coupled to, to such chiral waveguides. So, so far, you know, these experiments have sort of shown that, they, that you can have two-level emitters coupled to such a waveguide. We now want to have, you know, several of these things. And uh, we want to look at the di dissipative dynamics of, the, of, of such a collection of spins. And we want to drive them, which will sort of make uh, this thing interesting. And uh, yeah, this is a sort of a non interesting non-equilibrium dynamics in condensed matter physics. And uh, in this talk, I will just focus on sort of one spin chain and one waveguide. And to give the punchline away, what happens is if you break the symmetry under the right sort of uh, conditions, you, you, you find a steady state, which is a dark state, where all of these atoms sort of uh, form up and pair up in dimers. And you see here a plot of, of the purity of all these you know, spin pairs as a function of time. When you drive the system, they all sort of go to a pure state. And, but one can also go to sort of more interesting steady states by playing around with different parameters. And you can find steady states where now spins cluster in sort of more highly entangled uh, yeah, clusters like here, quadrumers or tetramers. 
uh, and uh, I will show you how this works. So the theory, as I said, will be just plain vanilla uh, master equation for these spin chains. Uh, and, you know, the basic physics, I, I probably in this audience, I don't really need to tell you much about it. So these atoms can, you know, they're driven, but their excitation can decay by emitting a photon in this waveguide. This can propagate and, uh, and be sort of reabsorbed by a second atom. And uh, if we now have many of these atoms, we have sort of left moving and right moving excitations, and the system is open. So what we have is a driven uh, many body system, which is interacting via this waveguide and which is open because we have an input and an output port. And uh, we usually describe this here with, with a Markovian master equation where the, the region of validity, validity is, of course, this weak coupling, but then also uh, we need to neglect sort of retardation effects. And uh, this is uh, exactly the point that I will sort of relax in the second part of my talk. So let me just guide you through this, this, this master equation for such, a, for such a setting where the symmetry between left and right is broken. So first of all, there is a, a coherent part which describes just sort of the, 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 the Hamiltonian of the system which is driven with a coherent field, omega here, and then there will be a part that is very familiar from sort of uh, uh, master equations that are non, uh, where the symmetry is not broken. So this this uh, contains sort of these infinite range dipole dipole interactions because you have this 1D reservoir, uh, and then you also have sort of infinite range collective decay terms like that give rise to super and sub radians. Now, if you break the symmetry between uh, left and right moving excitations. Then there is an additional term in this master equation. And this additional term here is proportional to, to this difference of this uh, left and right moving decay rate. And uh, this is the, 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 the Lindblad term for a cascaded system. So in, in this term describes now the physics when, when, when atom sort of can decay, but then only emit to the right. Yeah? And this is sort of reflected here in this non uh, Hermitian effective Hamiltonian that the spin L can decay and the, the excitation can be absorbed by a spin J only if J is larger than L. So this term accounts for this unidirectional flow of information, for example, if you have gamma L equals zero. And then there's, of course, also some term that sort of restore this uh, Lindblad form of this master equation. Now, uh, we're interested in, in a very specific situation, namely when uh, all spins are driven uh, are sort of a distance that is common commensurate with the wavelengths of, of the corresponding of the drive. And uh, in the most simple situation, we're just interested in the situation when all systems are driven with the equal Rabi frequency and on resonance. Yeah. And what happens, as I said before, is that uh, the system uh, has a unique pure steady state. And uh, the steady state is just a product of, of entangled timers here, which uh, where the, this, each of these atom pairs form this superposition of both atoms in the ground state and in the singlet state. The singlet fraction sort of depends on, on the drive and on the difference between these decay rates. And uh, yeah, of course this works only uh, for, for an even number of spins because else there is a spin which is unpaired. Uh, so there's a very simple picture uh, how to understand this uh, dimer formation, and uh, let me sort of guide you through it. Uh, so the simplest case is just look at two spins, and you can look at the level uh, scheme. So there is this triplet manifold, and there's a singlet state of these two spins. And now if the symmetry between left and right moving photons would not be broken at this distance, which is an integer number of the wavelength, this is a subradiant state, uh, and this is uh, also a stable state. So what happens is, that our coherent drive couples only within this triplet manifold, but uh, there will be now uh, some uh, incoherent coupling down this triplet manifold. But what happens now is that, in contrast to the, to the bidirectional case, this asymmetry here, this delta gamma, introduces a coherent coupling between the singlet and the triplet state. And uh, that basically means that you, will have, you have here something like a lambda system, where you have in this uh, manifold now a dark state and a bright state, and this dark state is exactly 
this uh, spin singlet. Now, once these two atoms form a spin singlet, uh, form, a, form a dark state, the output here is, is, is zero because it's a dark state, and therefore there are no photons coming out anymore. And uh, for the other atoms that sit now, if you have now more than two atoms that sit uh, here, you know, this will look like these atoms are not here and they can also form their dimer. And in such a way, if you have now a chain of, of these two level atoms coupled in a ca cascaded way, you know, first this uh, pair forms a dimer, then the atom, uh, then the output here is dark, then the next pair forms a dimer, the output is dark, then the next pair forms a dimer, the output is dark. So in this you can also see sort of in, in the time domain, first spin, the, the entropy of the first pair goes down, then the second, then the third, and then the fourth. If the, this is sort of true if the system is cascaded, if the system is not cascaded, but the symmetry between left and right is broken, then this simplified picture so that this chain purifies from left to right is not true anymore, but still the steady state is, is the same sort of in structure. The only thing that is different is that the dynamics is sort of different than the whole system purifies as a whole and not in this sort of cons with this constant purification speed. So what I also would like to mention very briefly is that one can get sort of more interesting uh, steady states out by not driving all spins on resonance, but for example, changing the transition frequencies of the atoms in, with certain patterns, then these patterns uh, are reflected in the end in the steady state of this, uh, of this spin chain. You can produce all types of steady, of multi-partile entangled states. But one can also sort of, you know, maybe from an experimental point of view, this is crazy, but from a theoretical point of view, it's actually quite cute. You could sort of entangle these dimers by introducing additional waveguides that sort of cross now these spins, you know, not in this order, but sort of in different orders. And in this way, you could also sort of, at least in theory, entangle this dimer and form a more uh, highly entangled multipartite uh, steady state. Yeah? <laughs> okay, next slide. Yeah? So with that, I'm finished with my first part, and I would like to sort of move on to the second part. And uh, of course, it connects to the first part in the sense that so far uh, we've looked at, at you know, atoms that interact via waveguide where we neglected this retardation time here. And what we do now, want, want to do now is we want to move these atoms apart. It look basically the same thing, but now sort of looking at the effect of, of this uh, finite retardation time. And, uh, you know, have now, you know, several photons here in this waveguide. Uh, and sort of a related problem, of course, which uh, is sort of simpler to write down and which I will focus now in the next couple of slides is sort of an atom that is interacting with a waveguide, but then also with its own mirror image but where one has a certain delay time uh, for these photons propagating to the mirror before they hit the atom again. And to do this, uh, or to explain to you sort of the formalism in how we uh, want to treat this, let me sort of briefly remind you about sort of the quantum stochastic Schrodinger equation and how we, we somehow think about this uh, system. So for in the simplest case, when we just have one atom coupled, you know, in a purely unidirectional way to a cascaded waveguide, uh, what we write down is, is a, a system bath interaction Hamiltonian where the system sort of can decay by emitting a photon at a time t. And this is sort of what we do here is really a rotating wave approximation. We assume a finite bandwidth uh, of this bath and introduce a cutoff. And by, by doing so, we can write down the interaction Hamiltonian in this form, where this B of t are now quantum noise operators in the very uh, standard way one, one, one looks at this in quantum optics. And uh, what we do now is we, we, we integrate the Schrodinger equation corresponding to this interaction Hamiltonian in a stroboscopic way. So we introduce a time step, delta t, which uh, sort of satisfies a certain hierarchy. Namely, it should be much, much smaller than the system time scale on which this atom uh, evolves, so the, the driving and, and the decay rate. Uh, but it should be much larger than these bandwidths uh, of, 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 uh, of, of photons sort of that we introduced out of consistency with, with the rotating wave approximation. So, and if we, inter if we integrate this, this uh, Schrodinger equation for the system and the bath in a stroboscopic way from a certain time Tn to a time, you know, Tn plus one, what happens to the state vector, 
uh, at the time tn, it, you know, you get out the state vector at the time tn plus 1 by applying a unitary, which now consists, you know, of an evolution with the system Hamiltonian, which is just a coherent drive. But then also these terms here, which uh, correspond to emission, or, uh, you know, decay of the atom and the emission of a photon. So this term, if you're familiar with this quantum stochastic Schrodinger equation, represents sort of this quantum eta increment, which is just a time integral over the quantum noise from time tn until time tn plus 1. And that will give you sort of a very sort of uh, physical in interpretation of this, of this equation here in, on the next slide. So we'd like, just like to say that these uh, Ito noise operators here have sort of bosonic commutation relations. So at different times or different time steps, actually, they obey sort of bosonic commutation relations. And from this sort of, you know, stroboscopic integration of the Schrodinger equation, we, we obtain the, this quantum st this, uh, stochastic Schrodinger equation if in the limit dt going to zero if we do it formally. Yeah? So what's the physical interpretation of this equation? Well, you know, this, this, the, in the first time step, you have the, the system bus uh, wave function at time zero, and we want to have the wave function at time uh, zero plus delta t. So this is the interaction Hamiltonian. So we have the system, it is driven for time delta t, but then it interacts with, with the bosonic mode, which is this delta b of zero. Yeah? So in the first time step, the system can, you know, with this term here, with this term here actually sort of, you know, emit, a, you know, decay and emit a photon in the first time bin. So this, this b is really creation and annihilation operators in, in, in the time bins for the photon. In the next time bin, you know, now the photon can, for example, you know, evolve with this system Hamiltonian, can be re-excited, and then in the next time step, it can again sort of emit a photon, and in this sense, this, this quantum stochastic Schrodinger equation has really an interpretation of sort of a conveyor belt, where you have now bosonic modes that talk with the system one after another at each time step. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, this is just one sort of trajectory. The whole system... Uh, state vector contains all the amplitudes, you know, uh, where no photon was emitted at all these time steps, where one photon was emitted, two or many photons, and then there is, of course, the conditional wave function, you know, associated with a certain emission path. And uh, from that, we, we get out, of course, if we trace now over the photons, we get out standard master equation for, uh, for this system. And uh, what we want to do now is not trace over these photons, but keep them. And we want to write down this state in, in, in a matrix product form. Yeah? What does it mean? So this state here, if I write it like that, it's just you know, written in a basis where this is sort of the system degrees of freedom. This is the, 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 the photons in the first time bin. This is the photons in the nth time bin. So this, this state vector is just corresponds to a certain configuration. You know, system down and you know, photon emitted at time 1 and time t2. And then there are all these amplitudes for all these different... Uh, uh, states and these amplitudes what we want to do we want to write them down in a matrix product state which uh, uh, which pictorially is represented like this so there is a uh, this matrix product state and it has sort of physical legs there is a system there is an input and an output and of course I know that not everybody is familiar with matrix product states so let me just give you a very brief reminder of, of uh, about matrix product states so matrix product states, as I said before, are you, you know, developed in, in the condensed matter and quantum information community to, to describe states uh, uh, of many particles. Uh, and in particular, they are sort of efficient state representation on a reduced Hilbert space. And in this reduced Hilbert space, this is a Hilbert space of states where uh, the particles are only slightly entangled. And the main idea is, as I said, to represent the wave function as a, as a product of matrices, yeah? and the, the main sort of uh, advantage is that instead of having sort of d to the n coefficients, where n is the number of, of sites or photon bins in our problem, we have now sort of d times n times d squared coefficients, where d is the bond dimension. This sort of represents the states more efficiently if your entanglement is small in the system. And sort of formally, uh, pictorially, what people do is they write down such a Coefficient is just, you know, you have different physical legs which correspond to the different indices here. And you write this down here, this matrix product uh, as, as sort of, uh, you know, boxes where each box represents a matrix. And 
they're connected, that means these matrices are, uh, you know, multiplied together. And for the expert, um, this is a very technical slide, I apologize. So how this matrix product state sort of, uh, uh, this sort of, I would like to explain how this matrix product state sort of connects to this simple picture that I've drawn before. So at each time step, my system interacts with one bosonic mode, as I said. So this one bosonic mode is the input state at a time t0. At time t0, for example, all my input is in, in, a, in the vacuum. So this is a product state. So I have an interaction of my system with my first, you know, time bin photon. And so I produce a matrix product state at the second time where my system now is entangled with the output field, which is the, the time bin, the, the, the first bosonic mode. And in the next time step, the input is sort of the next, is the bosonic mode corresponding to the next time bin. And with this sort of, I can, you know, go through my, my, my system, it's this, this input state and produces an output state, which is now entangled with the whole, uh, with, with the system, yeah? And I should uh, point out that this is actually the, the very definition of, uh, you know, if you take the delta t going to zero limit, this is the very definition of a, uh, of a, of a continuous matrix product state or what people write down when they talk about continuous matrix product states. So as a, it's just the output of a zero, so zero dimensional boundary field. And uh, what we wanna do now is sort of apply these kind of methods to, 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 to systems involving a feedback and this feedback will sort of introduce a new twist. So the simplest uh, thing that we can think about now is adding a mirror, yeah? And if you have now a mirror, then the system bath interaction is given by this Hamiltonian. And, uh, you know, it's very, it's the same as before, but now we have, you know, photons, the photons here are sort of converted to photons that propagate to the right. And there are two relevant parameter, parameters in this system. One is the delay time that I was talking already before, which is simply given by the length here times the speed of light. Uh, or, and, uh, but there's also the round trip phase, yeah, which tells you where your atom sits with respect to the wavelengths, you know, as a, in, in, where, yeah, at which distance in front of the mirror the atom sits with respect to the wavelength. And the two sort of most interesting points are sort of either it sits in a node or in an antinode. And this is this round trip phase, uh, which is zero if it's in a, in a antinode and it's pi if it's in a node. And if you write down now the quantum stochastic Schrodinger equation for this problem, then what you find is, well, this unitary that propagates the state from a time n to a time n plus one now contains, uh, uh, you know, the interaction with the photon bin at a certain time tn and also the interaction with the photon bin at a later time. So this contains the terms where the atom emits in the time bin, you know, n here. And it contains a term where it absorbs at a time n minus m, where m sort of quantifies the time being in this delay line. And uh, so in this pictorial representation, this atom can emit into this time bin. Now this photon propagate. The atom can in the meantime sort of do Rabi oscillation, can emit also sort of in, 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 in this output. But then after some time, you know, this time bin where this photon interact, you know, emitted a photon toward the mirror, this photon will come back and then it can be reabsorbed by this atom. And in this matrix product state language, what happens is that you have now a local interaction between your system and your input, and you have a long range interaction between your system and your, your feedback. And so in each time step, we have to implement one local and one long range interaction. <laughs> and uh, what we do is basically, I mean, it was introduced already almost 10 years ago in, in condensed matter physics, uh, what we do is we, in each time step, we sweep, we swap this, this boson here through the chain, let it interact locally and swap it back. And that's just a technical side remark. So with this, we can now sort of look at what happens. The yeah? most simple situation is you have an atom initially excited and you want to, you know, it's not driven for the moment. Uh, we just want to see how this sort of decays into this waveguide if you have the mirror here. Now there are two different situations. As I said before, it could be in the node or in the anti-node of, of this, uh, of this uh, structure. And, uh, and the, the physics is very different. If it's in the node, you know, if the speed of light would be infinite, then uh, the decay time of this atom would just be, you know, increased 
because, uh, I mean, we heard this already yesterday, the decay time of the atom is just twice the normal decay rate. Uh, now, if, if you sort of take into account a certain delay time, the atom, uh, you know, will initially just decay at the normal uh, decay time that you would expect if there would be no mirror up to sort of the, the round trip time. And then it knows, oops, uh, I'm, I'm in a node, an uh, anti-node, uh, I should actually decay faster so if it gets the feedback uh, uh, and it decays then faster and, decay, uh, and it learns here that it's sort of sitting in this, in this uh, anti-node. On the other hand, if you're sitting in a node, then of course in the infinite speed of light limit, your system would not decay at all. Yeah? It doesn't couple. Uh, but of course now, if you have this mirror far away, you know, initially until you get to the round trip time, the system just decays with standard Markovian decay. Then the photon comes back and the system learns, learns exactly sort of the phase of the photon and sort of now saturates, you know, not saturate, I mean, it doesn't decay anymore at a certain time. So there is a steady state population of this atom which remains in the atom even if you sort of move the atom quite far away from the mirror that's given here. Yeah. But the system becomes more interesting if we now include the coherent drive of this atom. And uh, what I've plotted here is exactly the same thing. I mean, we, we start with the atom in the ground state and we just drive it. And uh, uh, initially, sort of, you know, no matter if the atom is a node or an antinode, it follows just the standard optical Bloch equation, which is this red line. You know, both here and here, it's sort of in the, uh, we have less than critical driving field. And uh, then at the round trip time, sort of here we have it for different round trip times. Uh, after the round trip time, the system then gets the feedback from the mirror. And if it sits sort of in a node, the, the phase of the atom uh, of the photon is such that the, 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 the system actually uh, absorbs this photon preferentially and sort of, uh, learns about the reduced decay rate into the waveguide and the steady state population is then, then higher than it would be just without the mirror. And with the mirror, uh, with the atom in the node, it's exactly the contrary. So it gets the feedback from the photons coming from the mirror. They, they uh, increase the, the scattering into the waveguide and the system sort of, uh, the, the emission into the waveguide is enhanced. So the, the population of the atom goes down. Uh, you can, you know, go to much um, to longer time delay. So this is a time plot for time delay, which is ten. Yeah? The, the 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 yellow line is again at uh, ten times gamma times tau is ten. The yellow line is again sort of infinite speed of light limit. The the the, the red line would be no mirror at all. Yeah? So the atom here sort of initially, you know, just does normal optical Bloch equation. Then it gets the feedback. It learns okay, there is an atom, a uh, photon train coming back. And it emits, this photon train stimulates emission into the waveguide outside here. So it gets, uh, it reduces the, 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 the population in the excited state, which also reduces sort of the emission then into the direction towards the mirror. Sort of after a second round trip time, there are not so many photons coming anymore from the mirror because the excited state population was lower here. So then it learns again, oh, I, I, I would sort of like to be in a more excited state, and you see these kind of time dynamics, and eventually you, you, you reach a steady state, which is, of course, neither described by, by both of these limits. Yeah. So what we can also do is, of course, look at, at the field you know, within uh, the atom and the mirror, but also the output field. And since sort of we have you know, this, this, this approach that we use has this linear dispersion built in sort of by definition, yeah, I, I'm sorry you don't see here very much, but this is sort of, we, we, we parameterize here this waveguide in such a way that we count the, the length of this waveguide. I mean, we, we just draw it like that and we count from here. And sort of this is the, the position where the atom interacts with the system uh, here. And this is where it interacts again. So you see this light cone behavior sort of First, until the round trip time, you know, it emits into here and into here in the, the same way. So this is photon current. But then sort of these photons here come back, hit the atom again. And, uh, and then the, the, the output here is actually increased because it's not only the output from the photon, but also this photon that fly by. And eventually you reach a steady state, yeah. What we can also look uh, are sort of output correlation functions, of course, second order correlation functions. So initially this is sort of the Okay, as a function, this is the second order correlation function as a function of time and time difference. 
So initially you have just anti-bunching of the photons at equal time, less the normal atom that emits. So we look at the correlation function out here. But then there's also an anti-bunching in a sense. If you detect a photon, then there will be also a reduced probability to detect a photon after the round trip time, which is again just the anti-bunching, you know, towards the mirror that you see then afterwards. Uh, and then, of course, there is some sort of intermediate, you know, uh, evolution. And eventually in the steady state, what you have is that also the, the G2 of zero is not zero because there will be a probability for a photon, you know, there is not perfect anti-bunching because photons can, uh, you know, directly come out of the waveguide from the atom, which would bunch with an additional photon that comes from the atom. But then there is also a possibility that two photons come out because, you know, one comes directly from the atom and one comes from the feedback with the mirror. Uh, what we also can do and what we do is that we sort of, I mean, so far we kept the output in a fully coherent way. Uh, and sort of kept the whole, you know, system, the, the delay line entangled with the output. We can disentangle the output by simply measuring it. So in the same, in the same spirit, we can just put a detector here. We, we propagate the state exactly in the way I described before. But now we always measure the output field and we get sort of clicks when there comes a photon. And we do this basically because uh, if we measure the output field, of course, it, uh, it's disentangled with the rest there. Yeah? And so the, the whole output here is, is in the product state, and this reduces uh, the bond dimension we need to, to represent the state. Of course, this comes at the expense that we in the end have to do trajectories to, to represent uh, the, the whole, uh, you know, counting statistics, whatever you want to calculate. So, you know, this is a typical plot from such a quantum trajectory calculation. So the red lines are different trajectories corresponding to different output measurements. Uh, the black line is, is the, the, the average of this, of thousands of such trajectories. And, uh, you know, it, it perfectly agrees, of course, with, with, with the fully coherent treatment. And the statistical error bar here is sort of not shown because it's not visible within this line width. Uh. Okay, so I already said why we are doing these trajectories. Basically, I mean, this, this matrix product state uh, approach is, uh, you know, doesn't solve every problem in the world, but and also here it's sort of limited in the sense that if you keep this whole output coherently, then the, the entanglement entropy of the, of, the, of the atom and along this wave line, if you make a cut here yeah, and you look what's the entanglement entropy of this system, uh, of this subsystem, then you see that it scales linearly with, with the delay line. And you know that linear scaling with the delay line in matrix product state is a problem because then the bond dimension diverges so you cannot go with this treatment to infinite delay line. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's limited, but you can go to some extent into a regime where it's interesting. Yeah? And what, what this, this you know, approach with trajectories where you measure the output basically helps is this is sort of the average entropy profile. If we measure the output and therefore disentangle the thing, and, and you see that the entropy profile is, is not as high as here. I mean, we don't... Uh, we cannot sort of make the claim whether it's linear or not. And I don't think that it will follow an error law. Uh, so I don't think this could sort of solve every problem that one faces. But in principle, it helps you at least uh, a little bit. Yeah. Okay, now in the very last part of my talk, I hope I still two minutes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I would like to talk about this, uh, this system when you have two of these atoms. Now, what changes here is now you have uh, sort of two input and output ports with respect to the mirror setup. These two ports now translate into sort of two uh, two lag matrix product state. And uh, now instead of having one local and one local interaction, each spin has a local interaction with each with its in its input and then a non-local interaction which sort of you know corresponds to the absorption of the of the output of the at other atom at a certain time. So uh, so you have two long range uh, terms in each time step. And if you have now more than two atoms, you have n, two n long range interactions at each, at each time step. So it becomes linearly more uh, challenging with the number of spins. Now you can do exactly the, you know, this, this setting with this that we have before with the dimers. And you see now this is sort of for such a situation where the delay between one and four is, is exactly equal to one over gamma. And uh, you know, the dashed line would just be the, the mass equation treatment indicating that both 
uh, pairs here purify perfectly, while if you have now a delay line, this, this purification is gone and they reach a different steady state. And this can be sort of seen, you know, you can scan the whole parameter space, you see if the delay time is, is small, then this atom here purifies perfectly, no matter what the, 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 the ratio of gamma left over gamma right is, as long as the symmetry is broken. Now what we can also do is we can look at the, the reduced state of these two atoms, including the photon field between them. And then we can see I mean, that if you include the photon field between them, if you have a long delay line, then you can still get to a pure state if your system is unidirectional. Yeah? If your system is unidirectional, these two atoms at the same time are not in a pure dark state, but the whole thing, including the delay line, is in a dark state. So there will be no output, neither here nor here. Ah, well, it's unidirectional. I mean, obviously, this is expected from a cascaded system because, uh, you know, in a cascaded system, you can, there is no, not really a feedback. So it goes only in one direction. You can solve the whole thing. You can redefine the time of the second qubit. And then it's clear that this should be, the output here should be dark. But, I mean, we also see this in, in such a treatment. Okay, with this, I'm at the end of my talk. Uh, I hope I sort of stayed in time. <laughs> uh, I will, just to summarize briefly, sort of I've shown you sort of the many-body dynamics of spins coupled to such a chiral 1D waveguide, and then also our approach to treat uh, these systems if you have delay uh, lines that are longer or long compared to, to the lifetime of the atom. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, no, they wouldn't. Uh, it's it's unique. In, you can show that it's unique. For example, if you think about the cascaded, at least I think they wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, if you think about the cascaded uh, version, yeah, it's just more more simple to think about that. Then you can write down the the master equation for for the first two spins by tracing over the last two, because the first two, it's a closed mass equation, because the first two don't know about the presence of the last two, because it's a unidirectional channel. Yeah? If you trace over the, the second pair of spins, then you get a closed mass equation for the first two. And then you can show it's, yes. Yes, but. Yes, but then the output of two would hit three before it hits four, before it can be absorbed by four. Uh, okay, if you assume that you get there somehow, I still am not convinced that this actually is the dark, that it actually is a steady state. But but you can show that that uh, that you know in this in the, this cascaded limit can really give you you know you can solve the mass equation you know, analytically from left to right, and you can see that this is the unique steady state. You know, in each time step, this is the steady state of the first two spins. They must go into this state. Then, therefore, the output must be dark, and now you can look at the next two spins, and they must also go into this time state. In particular, basically, in this case, the photon just experiences five phase shift after passing the atom, and then basically, you know, the what happens is that just one, you know, second photon just but wouldn't would that then also hold if you make his argument that you would one and four and two and three when it passes twice an atom would you also get the same argument Yeah. Yes, that's why it doesn't work, yeah. Yeah. There must be some hidden timing assumption because you're saying yes, like, yeah. like the, in principle if you're completely Markovian and don't have any time then there is no order of the atoms, yeah. just everyone is equivalent. So 
so somehow there must be hidden that there, there, there is in, in the derivation of course you have the hidden timing assumption which you say yeah, there is a this is after the order the timing just comes in as an ordering and the master equation Mohammed the master equation knows which one is one and which one is two and which one is three timing. so the, the timing yeah. is is there yeah 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 other yeah you know but the, 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 the mass equation really breaks the permutation symmetry here, yeah, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yes, I mean, if, what, what we looked at I mean, is, okay, if this is, of course, a, a, you know, interference effect, this timerization, so if you have additional decay channels to the outside world, then you sort of lose this uh, dimer very quickly, actually. And what, we, what we've calculated is that if you have a, additional decay channels that are sort of, then the purity goes down linearly with, with these decay channels, if I, with, the, with the decay rate into the outside world, if I remember correctly. If it takes the, 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 the I mean the thing is that if you for example go to you know 0 0.99 and 1 then it takes forever yeah? so because there, there are these different decay manifolds and the chirality sort of breaks I mean in, if you don't have a chirality these are decoupled and you don't have a unique steady state because in, within each manifold you have a, a steady state which is not pure of course uh, in general but if you now include chirality, you know, an epsilon chirality will break the degeneracy, you know, because it breaks permutation symmetry, and this will sort of, uh, you know, lead to a unique steady state, but of course the gap, the dissipative gap is extremely small, then if, I mean, it goes down with, with, the, with, the, with the symmetry breaking, and I don't remember exactly how it goes down, I would need to refer you to the paper. All right, uh, we move on, let's thank Herr again.